that these guys are incredible. Looking at the scores from day one, I went ahead and wrote them down just in case I forgot how one-sided both games were. Rogue beat PSG Talon 16 to zero. Not a single kill onto any player on Rogue. 25 to seven was Dom Juan's final score over D JDG. Both of these teams, just such incredible showings on day number one. But hey, we're already into the draft for day number two. Let's forget about the recent history. Let's go to what's happening right now. Twisted Fate, Camille, Nidalee, Renekton, Orn, Lucian, all banned away. It's Hecarim, Syndra, and Callista picked up here for Rogue. As on the other side, it's Marksman Town, baby. We got Ash and Graves both locked in. Mm -hmm. Targeting some of the key picks was Rogue. The Camille has been so big throughout this tournament. Nuggery is one of the best in the world. We have seen Showmaker dominant in the LCK on the TF, so that feels like a an absolute must take away. Going to be interested to see if there is parity here uh, in that final pick, if they're going to grab Showmaker's selection. It does instead look like this will be Pantheon support for Barrel. Uh, he is the guy who does play this a lot. It was his most played in the LCK, so we yeah. are expecting it to go down there for sure. Yes, it could theoretically go somewhere else, but um, not really worth considering given how often he does like to play it. Plus, a point and click stun is great against Callista. This is a champion that has a lot of dodging opportunities through her passive with the martial cadence. Can't dodge away from a guy hovering his mouse over you and then pressing a button. <laughs> it's very good at locking down those slippery champions. Barrel, as you already said, his most played. So many supports share champions in common, but Pantheon's one of those ones that it's, it's kind of hit or miss. Some people play it, some people don't. Some people that play it aren't good at it. But yeah. Barrel is the Pantheon player for support. And, and I mean, it, it's kind of representative of the play style of this team, right? You know, every single person on their team, except for Ghost, was first team, all LCK, right? And it's yeah. like, Barrel's like, all right, Ghost, good luck, bud. <laughs> get out there on the map. You have a good time. Be back here in 20 minutes. Uh, they like to get things going in the other lanes. Ghost, though, uh, was dominant yesterday. You know, he is a very good player in his own right, but he is kind of on a team surrounded by four absolute stars, and he's new to the scene. So uh, this is one of those things where, where he is not prioritized for the team, not because he is not good, but because they like to play through top. They like to play through mid. And I am expecting last pick probably uh, for Nuggery. I do think it would make sense, with, given that, right. you know, Rogue, their big weakness is Finn, right? That is the guy you are expecting them to target. And that is the big reason, honestly, why people are not expecting Rogue to get through this group because you have Dom Juan with Nuggery, you have JDG with Zoom, you have these guys who are, are so dominant in the top lane. You know, two of potentially the three best top laners in the world in this group. Um, and then, you know, Finn is going to have to be able to survive that. Silas could be a flex. And I actually love Silas as a pick here, not only because, you know, Showmaker is very comfortable on this, but guess what slams Malphite? Silas, you can't pick it if that is in the game because you're going to give over, like, you know, an AP character. Um, that ultimate that he can steal and just crush you with. So he is going to go to the GP. This was his most played in the LEC, but this is something that can be picked on. I'm going to be really interested to see what Nuggery does go to. You know, I don't think that this will be flexed the top lane. I do think that's a mid lane Silas. And we get to find out how aggressive does Nuggery want to go. The Rise would be a very strong pick. Kale also good. A lot of the ranged top laners that can scale are very strong in a GP because you have the ability to outplay the barrels to knock them down, and you have the ability to scale alongside and really get access to the tower to be able to punish GP by taking plates, by pressuring him there. And that got locked. So that so um, we will see. Lulu, Lulu. is this going to be Lulu, Lulu top? top, maybe? Or is it going to be Lulu support and... It actually is going to be Pantheon mid, so wow. They are completely okay. throwing a, a wrench in the gears here. Shake it up Showmaker a little bit. Showmaker did not play Pantheon all summer split. So, you know, I was writing it off as, as a Pantheon support for sure. And it, it doesn't look like it's actually going to be the case. No, but... Or, no, they're no, swapping yeah, again. They, okay. they switched around. It's Barrel and Pantheon. It's top lane Lulu. Okay. Now, this could be, yes, supportive Lulu. Ha ha, cast AP yeah. and whatever. I want to see Machine Gun Lulu. I know it's just a solo queue build and it's not very good, but... Oh, I would love to see an aggressive Chad Lulu take I mean, over the group stage. I wouldn't be shocked to see something, you know, somewhat aggressive, uh, something along the lines of Roa at the very least, I think could make sense. You don't want to be too squishy up there uh, against GP, you know, being able to get burst down with the jungler does come. There is potential in that, but this this works similarly to some of the other matchups that I was talking about. Just range top laners in general, um, you can poke down GP. It's about consistent damage because GP wins lanes by just queuing you on cooldown with grasp, slowly whittling you away. What he doesn't do well in is 
is when he's up against a ranged top laner, you go up to Q, the Lulu E's you, Q's you, slows you down, you know, Polymorphs you, is autoing you, like you're, the trade gets extended beyond where GP can win, and that's where it gets really difficult. And GP can no longer just sit back and drop a barrel and dissuade a melee champion from walking forward to him because of the risk of the, of the barrel chain. You know, you can actually win those little games where you're knocking down the barrel from your opponent. You're trying to pressure very hard. I I'm super excited to see this work out because it has been so long since I have seen a Lulu top. And this is a very different take of how to dominate a lane because, you know, it, it can turn from this early game lane bully to what you were talking about, where maybe you go Roa into just like, you know, Athenes and, and Ardent and all this sort of stuff support, and then yeah. all of a sudden you're just this super powerful support buffing up your graves and your ash and that can be quite strong too because this team wants to dive in on you there's a hecarim over there well if hecarim flies in and gets polymorph during the Terra ultimate that sucks for hecarim yep. and if you know Terra gets thrown in and, and you polymorph him before his ultimate can come down and these types of things can be very difficult to deal with so this is so interesting really excited to watch it okay airy is the keystone of choice here mm -hmm for Nagari, which generally tells us it's not going to be some crazy super cheese on hit Lulu because those generally yeah. will take press the attack or lethal tempo or something in the yellow shirt. I mean, this is better anyway for, yeah. for lane bullying, I think. So Airy will allow that consistent lane bullying there, looking at the keystones on everybody else. Electrocute on the Syndra this game, so no phase rush for Larson. Wants to go with just the straight up more damage option there. Phase rush, however, will be taken by Inspired's Hecarim. This is a champion where sometimes you see Conqueror, sometimes you see Phase Rush. Phase Rush does give you more options to get in and out in the fights. So he'll be opting for that this time around. Bottom lane summoner spells, both 80 carries, taking the cleanse. This is so interesting. Uh, what, what are they doing here? GP's going down um, towards that bottom side. And they're actually just stacking here. Maybe they're they're worried about some sort of an, an invade or something. Are they are they like what are they gonna do? Are they lane swapping? This is this is pretty interesting. So I think they're trying to galaxy brain. Okay, they, I think they were just waiting for for a late invade. Yeah. And they were just doing a five stack for um for a potential late invade and then you know waiting so long to walk around because if Canyon's already there on the graves, you know, sometimes they would go for that type of play and then all five members are there and you punish. And that's actually kind of trying to use what Dom One did yesterday to JDG against them. So I do like that. Pretty clever stuff. Um, but it does mean, you know, Finn actually started Trinket Ward and then dropped his ward and swapped to Sweeper. That's something that you see a lot from junglers. That is not something you see a lot from top laners. And this is going to mean that Inspired has got to drop wards for him because you are going to potentially be in a spot where, where you have no idea where the jungler is. It can be very risky. And Canyon is actually just going buff to buff, red to blue. He should be able to finish this off very early. And, and if they get into a split map situation, that's just going to be even more dangerous for Finn. But that being said, if you can survive and hold weak side and, and not just get slammed, well, that's great. GP is a great weak side champion. You can farm it out. You can scale it up. You can drop ultimates on the bot side for your Hecarim and Terra combo who are looking for hard engages. But I think surviving is going to be so tough when you have no jungler up here to help you and you're up against one of the best top laners in the world playing counter pick. Yep, the Lulu Ooh, will yikes. take over and control this lane. Canyon accidentally makes the Gromp lose its patience. You always hate to see that as a jungle. You want to kite it to the very edge of the aggro range, kill it right as the bar would have run out, but just took a little bit too long on that one. And now he's topside. Oh, oh man, died. if Finn dies as this wave crashes, I that is just dead. a tragedy. He's not level three, so he has no yeah. W. Level two, here on the gangplank. No mana left to work with first, but they made it look so easy, man. Dom one gaming with that first blood. Their preparation is honestly just too good. You know, I, I was talking to some casters yesterday about you know how you would punish Finn. You know, after he showed the Malphite, and it's ranged AP top laners, right? I was thinking Vlad, I was thinking Cassio, you know, maybe even Kale, things like this. They bring out the Lulu. They have the map split with the Graves going buff to buff, and they time this double level three dive on a stacked wave where Nagri has zoned Finn away so he cannot be level three, and there's essentially no, no nothing he can do, right? Like, if you don't have the orange there to try to get a heal and some sort of outplay, there's no chance. And you force the TP now on a mana crystal, you know, GP's always trying to hold out to get Sheen on that first buy, and then you're really much more in the comfort zone. Right. Um, so he is going to be in a pretty bad spot. Thankfully for him, at the very least, Nuggery is not the one who got the kill, and you know he is farming okay. So if he can actually get this wave reset, uh, he could put himself in an okay spot, but I don't think they know where Graves is, so Inspired's got to get up here and try to help him escort in this wave. He really wants to reset it, 
and, and be able to to get himself out of the danger zone. Yeah, we saw a big wave, like two waves colliding into the turret, but Finn is still even with Nagari on farm. Mm -hmm. So it's not like he lost more than just the death, really, in that 1v1, or in that 2v1, excuse me. But Inspired is showing up here. They want to shove this wave in. They need to just make sure this resets. This is something that I've failed to do for you a hundred different times in our games <laughs> together, and I'm sure you're hoping that I learned something from the way that they're able to play this game together, but unfortunately, I will not, but that wave will crash into the turret. Hey, you come up sometimes. You just take the wave when you come <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a reason I'm not on a pro team. It's Canyon rotates into the mid lane. He'll be doing the same thing that we saw top, making sure that this wave collides, providing Showmaker with the opportunity to get out of the lane, reset, do whatever he needs to do. But strangely enough, Finn didn't actually base there. You know, I, I expected that maybe Finn could have gone back and like got a call or a Doran's Blade or just something. Because uh, really he just wants to survive this. But he did decide to stay around. Uh, Nugri is very low on mana, so he may not be punished for this. But his health is getting pretty damn low. Uh, thankfully for them, they did see Canyon show mid lane and then head over towards the bot side. So he's not really worried about a dive. And as a result, Finn may be able to hang in there in lane. And, you know, if it just kind of continues as a farm lane from here, then I I'd say Finn's looking good. Now, Finn on the Gangplank, still keeping that farm nice and close. Remember, once he does get that Sheen that you were talking about, the Grasp Enchanted, Sheen Enchanted bullets from the parlay as he puts more levels into it will eventually get to the point where they'll be able to do a little bit of damage past Lulu's shield. And remember that as a champion, Lulu has shielding but not healing. So even if he's only able to chip away a little bit here, a little bit there, it will still be able to try to whittle her down a little bit, maybe make her use potion yeah. charges, something or another. Uh, also, one thing that I didn't point out earlier when we were looking at keystones that is very much worth mentioning right now is Canyon's Ignite on the Graves. This is a choice that we do see sometimes, not super common, but it gives you a lot more kill potential, a lot more kill threat, particularly against a champion like a Hecarim or a Gangplank that have a lot of healing in the kit that can use that to escape what otherwise would be a deathly situation. But it does mean that if Canyon's ever caught out, boy, is he in some trouble. So this is actually, ooh, mid lane Larson trying to defend himself here. Showmaker gets aggressive. Yeah, and he is six, so he can actually get the Syndra ult before Syndra has her own ult. Uh, Larson does hit six there now. Um, but that that was a move that was very respectful from Rogue. You saw Finn back off the minion wave because it was stacked. You saw Vander and Inspired both go up there, but Canyon was actually nowhere even near, right? So uh, they didn't even go for that, and you now Hansama going to be taking a lot of damage. But he returns a lot onto Barrel as well. They both trade half HP for that. Usually, though, when you see those kinds of trades and you trade half on your support for half on their AD carry, you're going to consider that a win. Kill the AD carry in the 2v2, you're pretty much guaranteed to walk away with the double on that one. As Nagari, every time we pan up here, he's completely out of mana because he's always just using everything in the tank to harass Finn as effectively as possible. Keep the Gangplank stuck underneath the turret. Keep him low, and you're starting to see that CS lead build. As the Lulu builds up more mana, as she gets more levels and more points in these abilities, she'll become more and more oppressive here in this 1v1. Now, Finn goes back to base. He will finally be able to acquire the completed Sheen, has an extra Ruby Crystal just to make him a little bit tankier, up against all the shots he's going to have to be enduring against this Lulu. And he has to hoof it back up the top lane because, of course, you know, that teleport not quite available here just yet. Barrel tosses out a spear towards Han Sama. Now, the bottom lane of Rogue does have that little spirit there patrolling in their own jungle, making sure Canyon isn't coming around behind him. Canyon is level six with Ignite and Ulti on this Graves. Wherever he shows up, there will be kill threat. And you can see Finn actually dropped the ultimate to try to get that wave. Because he based, Nagri had the push, so he was going to lose that, and he didn't want to lose too much uh, tower HP there on that cannon wave. So picks up a, a few of those minions with the ultimate and, and does defend the tower a little bit. Uh, interesting build here from Nagri. So the early Swifty Boots is going to allow him to, you know, shrug off any potential slows from a barrel chain to be able to chase down and harass more effectively on Finn. And the Fiendish Codex makes me think that he's probably just rushing Athenes. That, that would be my guess here. Uh, yes, there are other options. Uh, he could be going towards uh, some, some other things, but I don't think that, you know, Zoni's Rush or Banshees or like any of those types of items really make sense here. So I do think he's just going to be going into a supportive style build, probably Athenes first, just counting on uh, the matchup itself rather than the itemization to win that 1v1 and to extend an advantage and then use that gold that he is stacking up to then not try to extend the lead himself but to empower his teammates right and to have this really early athenes and maybe into a death cap or more, maybe into just more full support of item trade after that and then say all right ghost canyon showmaker time to carry me 
And while we're talking about how the game's going to play out and how things will look, one thing that I think is always worth examining when Silas is in the match, how effective will the ultimates be that he can steal? And Syndra and Tarek are two different ultimates that you would look at and your first thought might be, okay, those are very powerful ultis that can change the course of the fight. But remember when wielded by Silas, they are both limited compared to their capacity in the hands of the actual owner. Silas can only use Tarek ulti on himself. He doesn't have a partner that it gets summoned down on, so there's not two zone, there's not two source points for it. And he only ever gets three orbs because he's not Syndra and he can't make more. So those two ultis will have limited applications. Yep. However, Hecarim ulti can be very powerful to engage into a team. We know what Gangplank ulti can do when placed down in a team fight. That's going to be an absolute mess with both of those just raining hell on the entirety of both rosters. So there are some good options here for the Silas. You can see Barrel once again working with Canyon here, playing aggressive in the enemy jungle, looking to see if they can find this horse and send him the old glue factory. Yep, I mean, Inspired, you want to play to farm when you're playing Hecarim, right? You are trying to get straight to Triforce, avoid the PvP, go for the PV, farm it up. But the fact that Ghost and Barrel are having the push, and Barrel just roams away from Ghost and just sits here in the jungle, plus the fact that Showmaker is constantly pushing, they have all these winning lanes, and it's allowing Canyon to just go into the face of his opponent. He already has a two-level advantage. You know, he's up oh, yeah. nearly 30 CS. He took the Herald, and he took the Dragon. And usually when you take those objectives, you're foregoing farming your camps as efficiently to do that. So usually you're, you're not creating an enormous advantage, but in this case, because of the skill of this team, because of the fact that they drafted for winning lanes, he is kind of getting to have his cake and eat it too. And as a result, he is going to be monstrously strong and then empowered um, by this Lulu who's already ahead. Finn does have that ultimate backup though, and you have six now on Vander and Inspired. So if they want, they could try to make a play around that. You know, dropping the GPL on the head of the Ash does make for a pretty good engaged target uh, with that Taric plus the Hecarim flying on in there. It's a very easy uh, dazzle stun coming off the Hecarim. You throw the Bastion in, you fear them straight into that stun from the Taric and it can be a really, really nasty engage on low mobility champions like Ghost. Damwon's going in to the mid enemy mid laner here. Larson's in some trouble, tries to flash away, evading the damage. Collateral damage comes through, but an amazing turnaround is able to find the kill on the barrel here. And now it's going to be a two for one. Showmaker tries to get himself out, but Han Sama's got the spear. Nicely done from Rogue. They find not the engage but the counter engage there as it was Damwon trying to go for Larson and it looked like Barrel did not get his shield up in time or perhaps he's a little bit too early to absorb a lot of that damage. Finn also was so quick on the GP ultimate. Credit to him here. Yeah, so he just didn't get it out. He didn't actually get that shield off in time. Great scatter from Larson perhaps before Barrel was expecting it. You know, generally for the Pantheon, they use their full damage combo. You come to the stun, they put up that shield to block all the damage. He was not able to pull that off. And as a result, really got punished. Burst down very quickly, but top turret, that is gone. And despite the fact that they get those kills, this is going to be an over 3,000 gold lead, very likely, when it's all said and done here. Uh, as Dom Juan have a huge top advantage. Uh, the Athenes is already finished. So now Nagari can kind of almost play like a funnel-esque game where he can start just walking around with Canyon. And Canyon can start taking some of the, the lane farm, you know, just power him up. And with this Lulu plus the Graze, who are both very far ahead, there's just no world in which you lose a 2v2 to Inspired and Finn pretty much ever. Uh, so they can really have the run of the map, and as long as you're kind of tracking where Syndra is, tracking where the bot lane is from Rogue, they can go wherever they want, do whatever they want. Perfect use of Shelly up there too, making sure to get the headbutt on the last two plates for maximum value with the true damage, securing the first turret. Three and a half thousand gold plus one Drake. The lead for Dom Wong Gaming, even though the score is only two to two. Four kills in 12 minutes, nothing super exciting, but the way this team is able to just build leads for themselves, we already mentioned the jungle farm advantage. Now, the marker for Hecarim to complete a Trinity Force with nothing but Hunter's Talisman in the inventory is 14 minutes. That's generally where you would want to try to have that completed by. Yeah. However, he did stop off with a completed Smite first as Showmaker's trying to trade here with Larson in the mid lane, but Barrel showing up. This time he gets the shield down. He blocks all the damage Barrel's coming out. He missed the spear! Oh, he missed the spear, and Larson comes out on top. He plays the fight well, and he gets the outplay. That was such an overforce from Barrel, though. Why did he stay after they couldn't get that kill? He just stayed in turn range. It was like he was not accepting that the kill was gone, and it was very <laughs> clearly gone. And Larson makes him play. This guy has been a monster for Rogue all year long. One of the best mid laners in the LEC for sure. 
now we got another fight breaking out here in the mid lane. Oh, ho, ho, ho. the Taric ulti barely keeping Inspired alive. It blocks the collateral damage. It blocks the second half of the Ignite. And Rogar able to walk away. Despite Dom 1's gold lead, Rogar doing a good job keeping their defenses ready and resisting the aggressive plays of Dom 1 here in the mid lane. Yeah, that Taric ultimate was perfectly timed by Vander. So often you see it coming down just a split second too late, but it landed in time, saved Inspired. Larson had the 1v2 outplay and oh, well, get out of there. Quick ins ultimate. Inspired walks out. Now remember, the Graves does not have the ulti to kill him, so it's not like he's under real threat now. Did use the ult to get away, but he'll be just fine. And yeah, talking about Larson, man, this guy was second in MVP votes, only behind Caps, who is pretty much the most talked about player in all of Europe ever. Yep. It's always like Caps is just such a huge force in the region. To be right behind him is absolutely a victory in itself. There's the power of Callista. The support gets caught out, immediately can just pull him to safety, make it so there's no consequence on that one. Dom Juan, they try to go for the play, pick off the enemy Tarek. But here's the cool part. Even though Tarek survives, Dom Juan still know that Cosmic Radiance has a massive cooldown. Mm -hmm. That's the trade-off for it being one of the most powerful ultimates in League of Legends. It will not be ready to go in time for this Drake if Dom Juan force a fight on the Drake immediately. They still have a 3,000 gold lead. It's only 15 minutes into the game. That is pretty impactful. Barrel's hanging around here in the brush. Won't be seen by that Hextech Sweeper. Tosses a spear at him, but nobody else is nearby, so it's not like he can engage and have the rest of the team near him to follow up. Nagari is walking down here, but here's the other thing I want to point out. Finn had recently used his teleport. He can't join this fight with anything except for his ultimate. If Rogue wants to contest this, which it looks like they won't, it would have to be a four and a half versus five with only GP ulti, so that one just goes over to Dom Juan. That is two to nothing dead. on the Drake count, and here they come for the mid lane. It's Shelly summoned up for the second time for Dom Juan Gaming. They've got the mid lane turret down below half already. One headbutt will take care of this one. Here we go, and bonk. Turret taking care. <laughs> and despite the fact that Rogue have, have done well in the skirmishes and the fights, Dommon is just playing the map so damn well and extending their advantages constantly with Canyon, you know, winning these lanes, being able to use that to get the jungler so far ahead. Uh, is really putting themselves in a position where I think Rogue definitely made the right choice to not fight that. You know, fighting uh, with this Lulu already at level 11 with rank 2 ultimate, you know, Canyon so strong. Uh, these guys were ready to go, and I, I think trying to fight that without the Terra ultimate would have been absolute suicide for Rogue. So uh, the one thing kind of going for Rogue is that Dom1, because they were focusing so heavily on getting ahead in gold, they did not stack super early dragons, right? So it's not as though uh, they're on pace for like that just past 20 minutes soul, right? They're about five minutes behind that mark. So Rogue will have more time to try to scale, to get the GP up to a, a spot where he's ready to go, to try to get Han Sama to two items. And then maybe we'll see them look for a fight around that because Inspired will have his Triforce ready. They're gonna have a lot of these key completions at the next dragon. That next dragon, they will need to potentially fight for it for Rogue, though. You really hate to let your opponents just get to that yeah. soul point nice and early. Total gold on the side of your screen right now. You can see the top three spots held onto by Dom Juan Gaming players, particularly that Lulu. Even a pure support build of an Athenes and an Ardent Sensor can be very scary if Lulu's got 2,000 more gold than you have. <laughs> Canyon walks up towards that brush, sees the red silhouette, backs away from it. Level 11 here on this Graves has Warrior plus the Yumu's Ghost Blade second item. Now, sometimes we do see a Graves go for lethality second. Uh, usually it's an Umbral Glade, but this time around, Canyon wants to be more aggressive. Yumu's gives him so much sticking power in a team fight to make sure nobody gets away from and him with those close-ranged autos. That's scary. And you gotta remember, he has no flash, and he's also kind of acting as a pseudo carry for this team, right? Because he has the Lulu power him up. So, I like know, the it. Ghost Blade gives you the added mobility. You're gonna have the Nimbus Cloak proc on your Smite, as well as the Ignite. So, you're gonna be able to amp up your move speed with that. You have the Ghost Blade for additional move speed, and you have Nuggery, who's likely gonna be behind you, speeding you up. So, that's kind of circumventing the flash that he has uh, not having access to this game. So, I do think it's pretty smart stuff from yeah. here. And, I honestly feel like this game is going to be decided the next Dragon Fight. I think that Dom Wander is in such a commanding position. If they get an early soul point in this game, it's going to be incredibly hard for Rogue to ever really find a window into fight. And uh, the, the tough part about that is for Rogue that they're going to be able to force Rogue to fight when they're still, you know, four or five K behind 
because of how effectively they have really extended this jungle advantage. So it's going to come down likely to the engage. You know, can Rogue time that perfect Taric ultimate alongside the engage from the hacker M, alongside the GP ultimate, and just get this layering of CC where you can then get access to these squishy members here from Dom 1 and try to burst them down? Because despite the gold advantage, they are all very squishy. This Lulu could die in an instant. So could the Graves if you can time everything. There's a lot of squishiness on both sides. The tier 2 falls on the top side, but when you're looking at the targets, and this is why I like the Ghost Blade on Canyon no so much. Yeah, there's no armor on anybody except for the Taric. And when I say no armor, I, I mean it. Like, sometimes you say that and there's, there's a cloth armor or there's a ninja tabby or something, but no. Everybody on Rogue is so flimsy against Canyon's damage with this lethality. It feels like one of the hottest topics in League of Legends conversation, and you tweeted about this earlier this year, was just losing to the shopkeeper. Players buying the wrong items in wrong situations and, and things along those lines. This Boris is shaking in his boots right now <laughs> at Canyon's galaxy brain. I don't think there is really a better purchase for a single item. You could have gone for a second item in this game other than Yumu's Ghost Blade. Mm -hmm. I think that this is exactly what Dom Juan needs to do to enable the Graves to be as successful as possible in this upcoming team fight, which, as you properly pointed out, is going to be so important moving forward. Yep. If Rogue lose a big fight at Dragon, I think you GG it. Yep, I mean, if Rogue fail their engage, you know, if you don't have that perfectly timed engage where you layer CC and you take out some of these members, you're going to get shredded because they just have so much more gold than you. And they're going to be empowered by this Lulu already with those two support items, you know, multiple AD carries who are really, really strong. So it's such a key moment in the game here for Rogue. I love that they have set up early, multiple pinks in the area. They know they had to be first here. We are seeing Damwon try to get control of the waves, try to draw Rogue out from those brushes and force them to come and, and check out this mid lane. And we'll see if Rogue does kind of respond to it. Canyon kiting the minion wave away here as Rogue decides to step out into the mid lane. Clear that one behind out. them, though. They do have scuttle control towards the Drake, but Showmaker coming in from behind. Remember, if he steals away the Hecker multi, he can be an engage on his own. Collateral damage comes through. Yep. There's that Hecker multi steal that I mentioned. Good Showmaker morning. is now a primary engage candidate. Larson has lost a little HP. Hansama has lost a little HP. Drake is up. Showmaker's in the pit. Barrel moving around from behind there. Does know that there's a control ward in that brush. We'll clear that one out. We're just sort of playing a game of musical rift here, Isaac. Everybody's just walking around the center, trading spots, seeing when the music is going to stop. Showmaker walking towards that tri brush as TP shows up from Larson arriving back into the fight. Drake is down to half HP. Over the wall goes Showmaker. Go. Could find his engage right now. Drake's at 2,500. There's spears in it. Hansama might be able to go in. There comes Cosmic Radiance. The dragon is secured by Rogue. They got the objective. Can they get out? There's the Callista ulti over the wall. Comes Showmaker, but he won't find anybody. Gangplank ulti is going to disengage it. And honestly, Rogue, just beautiful. They navigate the fight perfectly to take the objective, escape the Dom Wong counterattack, and stop the soul stack. Couldn't have done it better. Incredible smite there from Inspired. That was so key to be able to grab that dragon for Rogue, staving off Soul Point from Dom Juan. And also, credit to knowing their limits. No one got antsy on Rogue. No one just tried to pull the trigger on an engage and say, all right, we gotta fight, we gotta fight, they're poking us, you know? Everyone stayed calm, they stuck to their guns, they nailed the smite, and that's really the best you could hope to come out with from that position. But, you know, it's still a tough road from here for Rogue. I think the longer this game goes, the better it is gonna get for them. You know, with this Taric, with, you know, these members catching up, you know, GP getting to relevance uh, is going to spell good things for them. So they just need to keep hanging on because now, you know, really the, the earliest expected soul timer for Domo would be like 30 minutes because they didn't take an early first dragon. They lost the third one. Uh, so Rogue should have enough time to get to their items and earn themselves a shot. So instead, will they? Domon is just going to start the Baron and try to force their hand, try to force them to come to them before they can close this lead whatsoever. And Rogue doesn't seem like they really know until just now. Well, they're aware. The TP is showing up. Domwon ready to make uh -oh. the attack. The teleport will be jumped on, and Finn tries to get away. Now Inspired has to defensively ult to retreat. Back to the Baron. So Rogue has stopped the Baron attempt for now but they do it at the cost of their top laner summoner spells, both of them, as well as their big engage mechanism on the Hecarim there. 
However, Dom Juan will not immediately try to go back, but a TP is coming in behind Rogue. It's Showmaker wanting to show up here for the flank, but nobody else from Dom Juan can get in there in time. There goes your Glacial Augment power. Not Glacial Augment, excuse me, Hextech GLP. I see the two together so often, they are easily confusable, but the Cosmic Radiance has been stolen by Showmaker. He's at a point where he can drop that defensively, make some use out of it. Rogue once again avoiding the engage from Dom Juan, making sure they're playing with respect, but Dom Juan still continue building leads in this game. The respect that Rogue shows them means that Dom Juan are able to keep playing League of Legends how they want to, and the way they want to is knocking down all these turrets. Five to one turret count now, five and a half thousand gold up. The yeah, Rogue have done a great job of staving off the killing blow, but Dom Juan, as you said, they're, st they're still extending the advantage. It's not as though it's stagnated. We're up near 6,000 now, you know, past five and a half as they keep taking away Bus as they keep taking down towers. You know, this is where it's it's a lot harder to continue getting those objectives for Dom One though, is you know, just that one outer turret left in that bottom lane is a tier two, so it can be tough to get over there. But I think that Dom One can continue to look to force around objectives. Right now there's no TP available, so Nugger is just gonna go to bottom lane, try to bring people to him. If anyone comes in answers, he could TP up to Baron, and even if you know, they don't actually look to do that. If no one wants to answer him, well, then he's gonna pressure the tower and, and look to try to take even more of a gold lead. Rogue's doing a good job of avoiding the big old hit that just knocks your head clean off, but it's still death by a thousand cuts as Dom Juan's lead builds up consistently in spite of that. 90 seconds until the next Drake is alive. It is a two to one Drake count for the side of Dom Juan Gaming. A ward will spot out Kander and Hansama here. Canyon and Nagari will show up. They'll join up with Barrel. Uh, we didn't point it out earlier because we were discussing something else at the time, but when the vision chart showed up, at one point, Barrel had 72 vision score. Next closest was 30. Nice engage shows up from the Ash, but it's only onto the Taric once more. Remember, when Callista's in the game, you never have a pick on her support. No matter what's going on, she can always pull him to safety, but now the Callista ulti is down. Can they do anything in the absence of that? Taric is now a vulnerable target. Showmaker is off to the side. I believe the cooldown for stealing the Hecarim ulti should be just about expired by now. He can steal that one away from Inspired yet again. Finn in the chase here, but Showmaker with a good interrupt on that barrel, making sure that the explosion doesn't go off. Yep, Finn is now on two items though, so he is relevant. He has yep. the Essence Reaver plus the Triforce. You can see two items already done here uh, for Hansama. Uh, the Void Staff is a bit of a question mark for me, for Larson. You know, grabbing that early Void Staff, there's not really much of any MR over on the other team. So, uh, don't love the buy, you know, compared to just going Oblivion into a Death Cap or even just something like the Leandries. You know, uh, it, it's not going to be the best burst item to, to really just kind of one-shot people. You know, maybe is anticipating that there's going to be more MR coming down the tube or could be one of those things where he just felt like, okay, I can afford this right now and I need the maximum power the spike. because we are behind, we are losing. We've got to be able to be as strong as possible for this fight. And I think you know that's a reasonable uh, decision as well. Drake is alive and it looks like there's no contest from Rogue this time around. Because they bought the time last time around, they're saying, all right, this is the one that we have to sacrifice. It's still not Soul. Yes, it's going to put them in a bad spot going forward, having to fight for everyone thereafter, but they're just not in a good spot here. The arrow doesn't find the engage onto Han Sama, but he's putting a lot of damage down onto Barrel, nearly able to kill him off, and there he is, Gallop, Gallop! The horse has arrived. Rogue once again outplay the Dom Juan engage. Nicely done, Han Sama barely didn't have his cleanse, so that arrow actually could have been death. But Ghost and Barrel not on point here, not coordinated. Barrel has had a lot of missteps this game. We'll see, does Rogue want to try to force something? They get a kill here. They're up near that Baron area. They're trying to bait Damwon in towards them. Uh, but thus far, Damwon has not taken the bait. They are not willing to believe that they are on that Baron. They're just going to try to stay in mid lane, get control of this, push in the next wave. And Barrel's back on the map now with ultimate available. So uh, Rogue just going to take the kill and have to be satisfied with that. Yeah, Barrel 0 and 3 here on the Pantheon. I mean, the team only has two kills in total, so yeah, you can say he's at 50% KP, but I mean, it's, it's one assist. He's been in a bad spot here a couple of times. Some mistakes getting punished. It is a champion like Pantheon where if you go in, you try to do your job and the shield is down and your job's not done, you are. Yeah, because and, you're not walking away. And I mean, you can say it's, it's either one of their fault or both their fault, right? Like when you have Pantheon plus Ash and you have that the cleanse cooldown is, is still off cooldown, like he doesn't have it, you flash Pantheon stun, then you Ash here and it's guaranteed, right? And they didn't do that. They didn't actually have it layered perfectly. It looked like Ghost was shooting it at the same time as Barrel was going in. And as a result, that just barely whiffed. 
They aren't able to take down Hansama and do give over another kill. Rogue has done a great job of holding on. You know, they are still over 5,000 gold behind, but that means less now at 28 minutes than it did, you know, five minutes ago when they were still at that deficit. So, right. they're staying alive. And, and one big team fight win at this point could still turn the game, right? You know, if they get that perfect engage, they kill off Dom one and they take Baron, all of a sudden, they probably just win the game. Yeah, they staunch the bleeding. Yes, they staunch it at a 5,000 gold deficit, which is kind of like having one of your arms still just hanging <laughs> on by a thread. But hey, they still got it. The arm is still there, and Rogue is still at a decent enough spot in this game to fight back based on what we've seen from them so far. They have done an immaculate job at playing from behind and avoiding Dom Juan's attempts at the death blow. Dom Juan, on the other hand, have not faltered. They have not let Rogue catch up. They've maintained that advantage that they have, and now the next Drake is spawning in two and a half minutes. They will be able to secure Soul if they get this one. Look at the crit itemization from Canyon, going full carry mode here, recognizing that his top laner is strictly a support and he's got to be the damage dealer. Phantom Dancer already done, has that extra cloak in okay. inventory. Yeah, it's so much damage too if he's able to get in there and deal this damage with the Graves with that Lulu supporting him. Mm -hmm. And another thing I do want to bring up, we're getting close to the summit of Lulu's power. Remember when you're building support items like this, each one of these items is worth 2,000 gold instead of 3K-ish of a tank or a carry or something mm -hmm. like that. He will hit full build before anybody else, and then that means he's plateaued. He's yep. not gonna get stronger. So once Nagari and Damwon Gaming hit that point, that's when we really need to see them flex their muscles, take a Dragon Soul, take a Baron, and look to end the game before Finn on the Gangplank catches up and just becomes a much bigger threat. Yeah, and I mean, Han Sama now, you know, has the Bloodthirster. He's getting to that point where uh, it's harder and harder to just burst him down. You know, the only healing debuff right now is from Ghost, and he may not have access to that backline. If Showmaker dives in there and can't immediately kill him off, you know, if Vander lands that Tarek ultimate, all of a sudden, the Bloodthirster, and plus the Blade of the Rune King, you're healing back up to full, and you're turning around that fight, stacking up spears during your Tarek ultimate. So Damwon really want to try to get a fight right now. Oh, Larson is caught out. The damage comes through, and he's going to be killed before Cosmic Radiance. This could finally be what Damwon Gaming is looking for. Showmaker gets himself away. Way. The stasis provides him the chance to get in and get out without being killed. He can go back to the base, TP back into the fight, and Dom Juan, they've still got one minute before the Drake would spawn, and they're going after the Baron. Yeah, one slight misstep there, and Ghost nails the arrow onto Larson. If it was Vander, he could be close to ultimate out. If it was Hansama, he could cleanse it, but nothing there for him. And Rogue trying to get an angle. Inspire looks like he wants to try to go for this steal. We'll see if he can find Inspire it. Inspire going in for the 50 50. Is he going to be able to do it? Look at him, maybe take down the Baron. No, he will not. Nagari gets the kill, and Baron is secured by Dom Juan. Now they're going back. They're healing up. Remember, if they get back out onto the map, they can go for the Drake's soul. They're going. Inspired will not be allowed alive in time to contest. This is the breaking point of this game. That engage right there in your Axe replay. Yep, and it's just Larson trying to get some damage down, but one misstep against Dom Juan. Rogue was playing with the Executioner's Axe above their neck this whole game. You step one position out, out of position, and, and that's it. They just get knocked out right like that. I mean, again, you know, Vander was ahead of him. If he could tank that arrow, he get pulled out of safety by Callista. If Callista gets hit, you cleanse it. If GP gets hit, you orange it. He's really the most susceptible person to that and stepped a little bit too far forward looking for that poke. And it costs them Baron. It costs them Soul. And now we will see if Don Juan can clean up this game. No. Dom Juan are starting their Red Bull Baron with a soul collection. One hell of a way to get things rolling here as now they're pushing towards the enemy base. They got that minion wave enchanted. Of course, they don't want to step up any further. They know that Canyon is in the bottom lane. They don't want to really force any huge issue without that jungler here. He is such an important part of their damage profile. Instead, they're going to regroup with him in the bottom lane. Ghost and Nagari right next to him. Canyon's feeling plenty comfortable here. That Mountain Soul giving these guys the extra shield just to make sure they can play as aggressively as they want. Barrel here coming in from the side. Everybody from Rogue is grouped up around this Tier 3 turret in the bottom lane, which means Showmaker just gets free hitting time on the mid lane Tier 3. That one's going to lose about three quarters of its health. Now Ghost is able to step up in the bottom lane. And this is where things get really dicey for Rogue. This is where split seconds can break the game because you've got to be picking and choosing when you go in. That ultimate was not it. There's a whole bunch of things that could have been it, but that is not it. Over the wall goes Vander looking to keep himself alive. Inspire going to be tanking up in the middle of all five. Showmaker 
grabbing the kill on to Vander, two down. We have been complimenting Rogue's synergy, Rogue's team play, Rogue's ability to avoid that axe hanging over their head this entire game. But when they tried to go in in the bottom lane, everything was out of sync. The Cosmic Radiance way too early. The Gangplank ulti didn't end up setting up for anything. And now Dom Juan is looking for that death blow. Showmaker tries to go in. He tosses his ally in there. Canyon with the damage. The remaining three players of Rogue trying to heal up, trying to maybe mount some sort of a defense here. The minion wave is still at the Nexus turrets and those are gone. The damage pours onto the Rogue health bars. Larson is eliminated and the volleys continue flying. Canyon tanks the turret even for a split second there in the Nexus. And that is it, Dom Juan victory. Move to two and oh in the groups. Another clean game from Dom Juan. They have come in so prepared to this group. Really, really smart preparation in both games. I loved how they attacked Kanavi in game one, utilizing the LPL invade strategies that they always do with Lilia to punish them. Game two here coming out with the AP range top laner against Finn. Try to deny any possibility of him being able to go to a tank, of being able to go sit back. And they extend these enormous advantages by getting pressure in the lanes, by super farming up their graves, and despite a really a valiant effort by Rogue, you know, avoiding that killing blow for so long, Dom Juan also never made the mistake to give Rogue that engage where they could turn around the fight. They were able to hang on and find their moment where they finally got a pick onto Larson. They kill him off, and that was really it. They just needed that one slip up from Rogue to close this one out. Rogue did a good job avoiding that slip up for the longest time, but man, watching two games now of Dom Juan, they're just built different. This team is so damn good An absolute at League unit. of Legends. The way that they're playing, the way that they're preparing, the way that they're executing, playing well around that support in the top lane, making sure to facilitate it with a properly adapted build for a carry in the jungle. And then even though they made those plays time and time again, trying to force things onto Rogue and Rogue responded properly, Dom Juan never lost their cool. They never went way too far in, way too ham. Yeah, a couple times Barrel was uh, maybe feeling himself a little too much, but it just ends up being a small misplay that gives Rogue over a single kill or two, not anything that cost them a major objective. There was never anything where it's like, wow, Dom Juan really tossed this game right into the trash bin with that one. Dom Juan was in control from start to finish. They kept the lead strong, and this team... It's easy to see why this team is a lot of people's favorite to come out on top of the whole thing. They are looking fierce here in Worlds so far. We'll be back for more Worlds after the break as P.